His word's still a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Isn't it? right. And it's amazing when you put that light right in the midst of the darkness, it shines so, so bright. Amen. Father, we thank you for tonight. Uh, Father, we thank you for the body of Christ, Lord God. Father, we, we thank you for our brother back here. Another another year in Jesus, Lord God. I thank you for, for Baron's testimony and to say you. You're using it, Lord God. It's the transformation. We ask you just the blessing, Lord God, for another year. And Father, those that have gathered in this place tonight, Lord God, you said if we seek you, Lord God, with all our hearts, we'll find you. And Father, we want to find you in your word, Lord God. We want to find that, that, find you in that, that, that place, Lord God, that you've revealed to us through your truth. Father, we thank you for the person of the Holy Spirit. It has come, Lord God, not just as, as some abstract figure, Lord God, not even like the, 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 the Shekinah glory that came and went in the Old Covenant. But, Father, he's come to not just be with us, but come to be in us. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord God, that it doesn't take a, a conjuring. It doesn't take, Lord God, an ambiance. All it takes is obedience, Lord God, to ask and to receive, Lord God, and allow that flow of the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. Lord God, and to lead and guide us into all truth. So we thank you, Lord God, that the person of the Holy Spirit has come to us, Lord God, as temples of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we need you tonight. We need your mind. We need your heart. We need your wisdom and understanding. Let the Spirit be the spirit of wisdom and understanding tonight as you just give us a, a deeper revelation, understanding, Lord God, of your word. Lord God, that we might be more faithful in the application of those truths as well. Father, I confess that in and of myself, I can do nothing. But, Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the spirit of truth, Lord God, for righteousness, Lord God, that's bought for me, Lord God, with, by your son Jesus upon that cross of Calvary. Come fill us, Lord God. Come teach us, show us, Lord God, and help us to be more and more obedient to you each and every day. And all the saints of God said amen. Amen. amen and amen. Once again, good to be here in the, in the presence of the Lord and in the company of the saints of God. Folks, tonight we're going to start our, I don't see Caprice. That's okay. She had an appointment tonight. We're going to be in our 31st uh, week in the, in the in the study of 1st John. Wow, it's time flies when you 31 weeks. How many weeks? 52 weeks in a year. We've been we've been at it just a little while. It's just once a week. But 31st week in our study of the epistle of 1st John. If you haven't been here for some of these, you can actually go to the website, biggrace.com, www.biggrace.com, and you can find uh, those other ones available on our link uh, on, on our YouTube channel right there. Just go to biggrace.com and click on First John. But we're going to continue in our study on in the epistle of First John. And we're going to look at some verses tonight that are very familiar to you. And they're, they're familiar in the sense that they've been often quoted as kind of standalone verses. And, and you know those verses, those verses that you kind of quote. And, uh, you, you may say, and if somebody says, well, where's it at? Well, I don't really know what's that, but man, it's just, it's my verse. <laughs> Anybody ever do that? You know what I'm talking about. It's like, wow. <laughs> She's one of Yes, okay, I've been out. Uh, it's not even his birthday tonight. But you know those verses that you quote, you're thinking, you know, I wonder what that really, what that comes from, what that means. So we're going to talk about some verses tonight in our in our text that are really standalone verses that many times they've been quoted as standalone verses. But what is going to make these verses tonight, I think, very interesting and, and, and enlightening. You know, there's one thing about being interesting. There's a lot of things in the scriptures that that's interesting. But what about that enlightenment, that, that time when the Logos becomes the rhema? And then you can take it and apply, as we talked about, the Sophia. You can gain wisdom from it and go and apply those type of things. Because Logos and rhema, those are great. But you got to use them. You know what I'm saying? I said the other day that, you know, uh, it doesn't look good to have a burden for the lost unless you've got feet to go do something about it. You know, I can get a, I can get a, a Logos and read the Word. I can get a rhema and say, well, that's great. But I've got to apply it to my life. And it's the same way with this. You know, this isn't just to give us a big head to give us a bunch of information. It's got to be a reproductive intimacy that comes into our life. We say, God, what can I do with your word? How can I use your word to really be a light in darkness? How can I use it to not only just change me, but to change those that are around me? So we're going to look at that in the, in the, in the context of something. And you guys that have been with us, you guys that are familiar with First John, you know, we're going to look at the context in which the apostle applies these truths, especially in the historical context of a corrective letter. And so First John is a corrective letter. Letter. You know, we look at other places in the scripture that are very corrective. You know, you, you find those, not just directive, but corrective. Think, for instance, like that 14th chapter that's often quoted in 1 Corinthians. People read that and they'll say, ah, oh, this is just some standalone thing. You know, uh, talking about, um, about tongues and talking about women in church. That's a corrective letter to a church that was out of order that he had to reel them in. So he had to put some standards upon them that you don't see in Paul's other writings because it was a corrective letter. It's very specific 
to that audience. So as we're looking at this, I want you to think through that mind, through that, that principle, that this is a corrective letter. These familiar verses are verses giving, given in a co corrective context as well. So remember, 1 John was written in direct response to a movement in that first century uh, that's really, really, folks, being mirrored today. And that was that the Gnostics. They boasted of a new knowledge. They boasted of a revelation. They boasted of Logos. They boasted of Rhema. But they didn't have a whole lot of Sophia wisdom. They didn't have that applicable wisdom in their life. Why? Because what it did, it caused them to run aground of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what it did, it stood in really a stark contrast to the apostles' doctrine. Because what it did, it presented this, this love, grace message that, that really made concessions for sin. Folks, how, how many of you know that the, the Bible tells us don't make any concessions? Don't give place for sin. Romans 6 and 1 says, you know, are we going to continue to sin so that grace can abound? God forbid. You've got to be kidding me, is you know, how we'd say it today. No, no way, because if I yield myself to those things, what do I become? I become their slave. I become the servant of sin. Folks, the, the chains were broken at the cross of Calvary. Now, we can go and pick those things up, and we can wrap them around us again. We can exercise that free will or that uh, self-determination, but God came to break those chains through the blood of Jesus. And so they came in, and they said, hey, listen, we're going to make some concessions for sin, but they also embraced some, some, some fallacies, and we talked about it concerning the very nature of God. And we talked about, in, I think, two weeks ago, that uh, uh, when it says that don't believe every spirit, but try the spirits whether they're God. And it's, it talked about that every uh, spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And so they had to address those fallacies as well. So today we see some of those same errors being repeated. If you've been in, in very many churches, you listen to very many radio stations, turned on Christian television, the same things that are being addressed in 1 John are being addressed today. We see the same error. We, we talked about that specifically in detail. And so what it's done is just been repackaged in a new presentable uh, format that can be sold for $49.99 in a cassette or CD package. And you can, you can get some free oil from uh, some uh, from free oil from Jerusalem or some holy water from the, the, the River Jordan. They just repackage it. And they tell you you're great and uh, you get your own personal word of prophecy 52 weeks out of the year or whatever it is. You're going to do great things. You know how they do. And so they build you up and they attack the ego of a person. It makes you feel and think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Then they can dump this stuff on you and say, oh, by the way, you're okay. I know you're in sin. I know you're transgressing the righteousness of God. I know you're not walking in faithfulness, but God is weak and it's your sin. Folks, that, that's, that's, that kind of thinking doesn't come from heaven. That kind of thinking it comes from the bowels of hell, and that's where it desires to drag people in. He said who the Son sets free is free indeed. He's not still in bondage. He doesn't still walk in air. He, he, there's a freedom that comes through faith in the finished work of the cross of Calvary. So, you know, we see it readopted, and now what it does, it adopts this, this greasy grace type of message today that really has very little to do with God's influence. You know, if grace is not influencing you towards righteousness, it's not grace because it's the goodness of God, that, that influence of God's grace that brings us to repentance. It doesn't bring us through repudiating the things of God. It brings us to a place of embracing the things of God. And so, you know, that grace has got to influence us, enable us to be holy as he is holy. To, and it has to, uh, more to do with, uh, with with permissiveness they teach and really dismissing righteousness altogether. And so many people teach, you'll hear this all the time, we hear it on the streets, that really sin and sinning is just natural for the believer. That's what they teach. Well, we're all this, we're all this by nature. Folks, I got news for you. I'm no longer a sinner by nature. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for the ungodly. He set me free from that, and he came into my life. I can't serve two masters anymore. Christ came in, and my body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 3 and 16. But if I defile that, what's defilement? It's called sin, transgressing the righteousness of God. God will destroy me. That's not good news, being destroyed. The good news is he's brought me freedom, and he's brought me liberty from those things, so I can be holy as he is holy, not by my own abilities, my own self-righteousness, which is like filthy rags, but by utter dependence upon the cross of Calvary and looking to him, the author and the finisher of my faith, diligently seeking after him that he was going to reward me. That's the gospel of grace is freedom. The gospel of grace is not I'm going to pat you on the head and send you on your way, and you're just going to be as bound and broken as you always were. Right. There's no freedom in that. I've got to believe that the cross of Calvary meant more from just putting the band-aid on our sins and sending us away. 
There's got to be something. The death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Death has been swallowed up in victory. And that the same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you. Mm -hmm. Come on. What's it going to do? It's going to leave you stinking in the tomb? Is that what he said? It's going to leave you in your grave clothes? No, Absolutely not. It's going to quicken you. It's going to put life inside of something that had no life anymore. So the expected behavior of a Christian should be what? To follow or to imitate Jesus, to be holy even as he is holy. Amen. You use words like holy, you words use words like Jesus used in that last verse in what is it, uh, 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 Matthew chapter 5, be perfect even as I'm perfect. Do, ah. Well, I, I didn't write this stuff. You see what I'm saying? And I don't have to rewrite it to conform to my frailties. I can stand upon the word of truth. Why? Because heaven and earth are going to pass away. But his word will not pass away. It's going to be the standard now, and it's going to be the standard then. It's going to be the standard eons from now as well, that all of these things are going to be stood upon. So if one teaches a message of holiness through faith and the finished word of the cross and the power dwelling of the Holy Spirit, uh, people will call it today legalism. They'll call it self-righteousness. If you say, listen, man, I'm going to stand. You say, I'm going to stand by faith. Having done all the stand, I'm going to stand. Well, brother, you're just being legalistic. You're just being self-righteous. Absolutely not, because when I was on my own, I couldn't stand. I was going to fall all the time. And so the message of the gospel of grace has got to come into our lives. So that's what he was dealing with. And we get these mantras today. Tell me if you've heard these. Uh, Christians are perfect, but only forgiven. You ever heard that one? How about love wins? What exactly does that even mean, love wins? You know, I see it all the time. These programs, love wins. Well, I know a lot of people that are lost. They ain't winning. They're going to hell. Hell is ever enlarging itself. That doesn't sound like uh, them winning. I know that there's a wide gate that leads to destruction, and many there are that enter thereat. There's a narrow way that leads to life, and few there be that defines it. Uh, how about this one? People don't care what you know until they know that you care. You ever heard that one? <laughs> what does that mean? Or, or what about this one? This has been retreaded many times from, uh, what's his name, St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, Use words. <laughs> you say, how do you preach the gospel and not use words? Is it sign language or braille or, or what is it? I mean, it's 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 it's, an, it's oxymoronic. I mean, the whole the terminology to preach means to go and herald something loudly. You go and do it. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're just demonstrating self righteousness. So you see what all those things do. What they do is they've deified man. And they've made man this great thing, this thing that people want to reproduce. And they've made God just this human person that's kind of a lot like us. He's got our struggles. He's got our frailties. He's got our deficiencies. Folks, I got news for you. God is none of those things that we are. He is none of those things that represented us. He is high and he is lifted up. His thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. It's like Isaiah saw, said, I saw the Lord and he was where? He was high and he was lifted up. And the prophet the prophet Isaiah in his presence, what he say? I am undone. I am unclean, and I dwell amongst an unclean right. people. But the good news is, just like it was now, it says there was a coal upon the altar that it touched his lips, mm -hmm. representing the Holy Spirit that has now been given to us. Folks, I got news for you. If you're born again, if you've been saved, sanctified, and don't make me go Pentecostal <laughs> on you and filled with the Holy Ghost and that with fire, Listen, there is a coal on an altar that has touched your lips and has enabled you to live above sin. Why? Because if he's lifted up, we talked about it this morning, he'll draw you to where he is, where there's no sin, where there's no none of that those bondages. You can walk in freedom. You can walk in holiness. All that stuff tugs at the heart swings. It gives you the, the warm fuzzies. It's good for Hallmark cards and all those things. But really, there's no basis for truth in it. So our study this evening, we're going to focus on verses 7 through 12 of 1 John chapter 4. And I'm just going to read those to you. Uh, the first time, I'll probably read those two or three times to kind of get them in you. He says this, he said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. How many millions of times have you heard that? How many of you were your kids, you, that you, you learned, that was one of the first scriptures you memorized. Beloved, come on. Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. <laughs> Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. See, you can only sing in King James. Try singing in the NLT. 
<laughs> or the NIV. You, just, you can't sing. King James was wrote to sing. You know what I'm saying? And so if you're going to memorize scripture, memorize it in the King James, and you can just sing that stuff, you know. All, all you want to sing it. So, you know, we, we hear those those phrases, and it's very well well worn. And it says in verse 9, it says, But this was manifested, in this, in this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. He said in verse 10, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation. I love that word propitiation for our sins. Anybody use that in normal conversation? Nope. I love it, though, because we'll talk about it just a little bit. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Like I said, very familiar, very powerful, very revealing passages. Yet once again, this look at some of the contextual applications of these statements. And so here's what we're seeing develop. What we're seeing develop through the epistle is this constant companionship between truth and love. Put that down. There's a, there's a constant companionship that we're going to see that is going to run through this thread. Truth and love. Truth and love. You'll see that these two elements are shuffled together. They're folded together like a deck of cards, uh, one with another, and they're constantly being reiterated through this whole epistle. I'll give you some examples. Uh, 1 John 1, 6 and 7. 1, 6 and 7. Just back up a few uh, chapters. He said, if we have, we say we have fellowship. We say we have koinonia. If we say we have that loving relationship with God, right? But walk in darkness. If we walk into a place where there is no truth, we see love, we see truth. He said that we lie and do not the truth. I'll give you an example of something the Lord revealed to me years ago. You know, you walk into a room, like a hotel room, you close the shades at night, you turn off the light. What's the first thing you see? Darkness. But what if you wait a few minutes? You start seeing things. You start adjusting to the darkness. It doesn't get any lighter. What have you done? You've just opened yourself up to the deception of darkness, and you think you can see. Folks, that's what he's talking about. That's what's happened in the church. What's happened? The, the shades have been closed. The, the, the light's been turned off. So rather than people getting into the Word and allowing the Word of God to get into them, what we've done is we've just waited long enough till we've adjusted to our culture, We've adjusted to our compromise. We've adjusted to false religion and false teaching. We've adjusted to our, our, our disappointments and our unmet expectations. We've adjusted that we're mad at the preacher and all these other things. We, we justify these things. And we say, you know what? I, I, I can see okay. Well, what happens in the dark room, even after you adjust to the darkness and, and your, your pupils dilate to that degree, you can see things, but you miss the details. You can sing the song still. Or you can quote the scripture. You might know the logos. And you might even got a rhema. But the Sophia application of those principles has fled you. Because there's no fruit in your life that has manifested those things. He goes on to say, uh, in the blood of Jesus, that uh, if, we, if, we, uh, if we walk in the light as he's the light, we have fellowship with one another. There's that love aspect. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Uh, jump down to the next chapter, 1 John 2, 5. But whoever keeps his word. Somebody say, keep his word. Are you keeping his word? Yes. Folks, you can't keep a word that you don't know. You see what I'm saying? You cannot keep a word that you do not know. David said, I've hidden the word in my heart so that I will not sin against him. And so that's the difference when you keep the word. Keeping his word, and in, in him verily is the love of God perfected. This is how we know that we're in him. How do we know that we're in him? How do we know that the love of God is perfected? Because we keep his word. Folks, you can't be obedient if you don't know what to obey. And so if you get out of the word, what ends up happening? You begin to hear all these other voices, all these other things speaking to you. And so what keeps us on track, what keeps us on line, what keeps us loving from the perspective of God, loving and knowing and operating from what God desires is to stay in the Word. Do you read the Word? Do you stay in the Word? Have you hidden it in your heart? Have you committed those things to memory? Because you know what it's like? It's like all those signs along the road. That's what the Word is. I, I, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because, man, I know the Word told me not to do that. Folks, it's like Paul said. He said, you know, without the law, he said, I would have no knowledge of the truth Come on. With, without knowing that. Folks, the same thing. Without knowing what Jesus desires from us, we don't know what it is. We run into people all the time ministering the gospel. You know what they have? They have a humanistic philosophy. So what they've done, because they don't know what God expects, they don't know who God is, they don't know the, the characters and the immutability of his, of his nature, what do they do? They look in the mirror and say, okay, God, you got to look like me. 
And so they begin to create this fictional God that fits into, in, into their perspective. They do exactly what happened. What is it, Exodus chapter 32? When the people said, we don't know what happened to Moses. So they begin to take off their earrings and the things that were valuable to them. They said, now make us a God that we can follow. And Aaron, you know, what he do? He said, I don't know what happened. I just threw that stuff in there and I'll crawl this, this golden cat. How'd that happen? Now, folks, we laugh at Aaron, but the church has done the same thing. We, we've thrown our schedules in. We've thrown our fears in. We've thrown our bondages in. And we've thrown our sins in. And we said, preacher, make us something that fits us. Make us a God that's easy for us to follow. Because we don't know what happened to that one that went away to prepare a place. He hadn't come back soon enough. And so we don't want that God that requires holiness and faithfulness and dedication through the fire, through the tribulation, through all these things. So make me a God that, that, that really is not going to require too much out of me. That he's going to pat me on the head and he's going to say, you know what, uh, 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 just put your bumper sticker on. You're not perfect. You're just forgiven and you're just a, a good old boy. And me and Jesus got our own thing going. Hmm. Folks, that's what people have taught. That's what people have been uh, believed to do. But if I hide the word, if I keep his word, then the love of God is perfected. Are you keeping the word? Well, how do you know it ain't good to run around with your wife? Well, because the Bible says... Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? No adulterer goes to heaven. Oh, don't want to get a part of that. Well, how do you know that you shouldn't be out getting drunk? Well, oh, no drunkard gets to go there either. Better not be lying. Revelation 21 8 tells me that no liar goes to heaven. Well, man, I'm just going to go hang out with my buddies at the bar and shoot a little pool. Uh, how do I know that I probably shouldn't do that? Well, James 4 and 4 tells me that when I'm the friend of the world, I become the enemy of God. Well, you know what? I'm just there. I'm really not doing anything. Ah, but 1 Thessalonians 5 and 22 tells me to abstain even from the appearance of evil. And so my values are determined, what? From my knowledge of the Word of God. He said his, there's people that perish because of lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of what? The Word of God. And so when I get that Word in me, I know what God expects. You know what? I'm not drawn away by all these other winds of doctrines and these things. He's cunning craftiness of man that is laying wait to deceive. Why? Because I know. And so I don't have to debate. I don't have to stand in line and wait for somebody else to give me a word. Why? Because I've got 31,101 verses straight off the skillet that I can apply to my life at any time. So I don't need somebody to confirm it because of why? It's been confirmed. Holy men of old wrote these things down. It's been confirmed by angels. It's been confirmed and tried and true and tested. So I've got something that I can hang my hat on that's going to happen. You don't have to give me a word that something bad is going to happen in this country. I got it. You don't have to tell me that the church is going to collapse. I got it. I don't need some prophet to show up and tell me all these calamities. I've got the, the book of Matthew. I've got the 24th chapter. I've, I've got these things that I already said. You're about 2,000 years late on your news. Why? Because he already knows the end from the beginning. If we just read the word of God. So, loving the word, loving the truth. First John 2, 9, 11. He that saith, he's in the light, but hates his brother. If I say I know the truth, but I don't have the love for my brother, you see, he's in darkness even until now, but he that loves his brother abides in the light. His word is what? Lamp unto my feet, light and dark my path. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Did you love that? When I'm walking in love and truth, it says that you're not getting set up for the fall. Come on, right. Don't you love that God? If I if I if I love the truth, if I walk in an attitude that's that's according to the Spirit, man, there's no occasion for me to stumble. Why? Because He's now made my feet like hinds feet that I can walk into those high places. Now I can tread upon those things. I can I can go higher in Christ Jesus. Why? Because now I'm sure footed. What does the Word tells us in the Book of Ephesians? It says, "My feet shod, my feet dressed." with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So I'm enabled, I'm strengthened. I've got all those things. And look at, look at everything in that, that armor of God. What does it all come down to? It's right here. The blessed prayer of righteousness. It's, it's right here. The, the shield of what? Faith. Faith comes by what? Here. The sword of the spirit, which is what? You see what I'm saying? It's all just getting into the word. If you want to be armored, if you want to be geared up, just get into God's word and allow that to come into your life. Let truth Abide in your life. First John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. There's a love part that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world does not know him because it did not know him. Why? Because he was the light. He was the word that came in. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They didn't want to hear that truth. Why? Because they knew if they heard it, they would be reproved by it. Uh, 3, 10, and 11. This the children of God are manifest. The children of the, and the children of the devil. 
Whoever does, uh, does not righteousness is not of God, nor he that loves his brother. There's love, there's truth. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. Jump down three verses. We know that we have passed from life into death. How? Because we love the brethren, but he that does not love his brother abides in death. Verse John 3, 18. Four more verses down. My little children, don't just love, uh, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but let us love in deed and in truth. And in truth. Well, the folks, the gist of this is this. His love should drive you to the truth, and his truth should fuel your love. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Yep. What happens when you get a taste of it, when you taste and see that he's good, it ought to fuel something in you to want to go deeper, to want Amen. more and more and more. And what ought it ought to do? It ought to cause you to love the brethren even more and more. So to take either element away from that equation is to remove really a component that's necessary to see and fulfill that full revelation that God has for us and desires for us in our hearts and lives. So Apostle Paul, Apostle John, excuse me, he literally, in this in our text time, he methodically, he strategically, he really calls out the body of Christ. He outs them. He, he, he says, listen, I'm telling you what's going on. And he outs those because what they've done is they've embraced this false love and this false gospel, and they very really what they tried to do is to attempt to strike the very basis of love, which was the truth. He says, listen, you've departed. You, you, you're not listening to the truth. Galatians tells us, listen, if anybody comes preaching another gospel, tell them that they're good intention. Chew up the sticks and spit out the grass. Is that what he said? He said, let them be cursed. He said, I don't care if it's an angel. I don't care if they come flapping their wings and showing their halo off. He said, I don't even care if it's me. He said, if someone comes preaching a gospel, a word that we've not given you, he said, let them be accursed. Come on. Isn't it interesting that we'll follow all this good advice from the Bible? We will follow that. Somebody will preach another gospel, what do we say? Well, they started out good. Well, they didn't intend that. We won't let them be accursed. Now, we, we think if we're not obedient to the Bible in other places, it's a sin. Well, what about that one? Why not say, listen, that's another gospel. Let them be accursed. Well, because they've propagated themselves into saying, don't touch my anointed. Don't do my prophet no harm. What's that news for you? They ain't anointed and they ain't no prophet if you're not preaching that word. You see what I'm saying? They're, they're false prophet and they've come and paraded themselves as something that they're really not. So they tried to take away, really, that and present that false gospel. So if you remember in our, in our discussion in 1 John 2.15, he said this. And this is such an interesting thing in regards to what we're talking about, love. 2.15, he said, do not love the world. Right? Neither the things that are in the world, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, that's kind of tough. Isn't it? Don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world, because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You know why it's, it's tough on some people? Because they don't read the Bible. And so, you know, I shared with you how that verse kind of seems to stand in contrast to, to what John wrote in John 3.16. What does the Bible say? For God so loved the world. Now he's saying, don't love the world. He said he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And you folks, I explained what that was a few weeks back, that what God loved was not just some random or some arbitrary, omnibenevolent thing that embraced every form of wicked person. That's not what he loved. That that's not what he was looking for. That God didn't say, you know, for God so loved every, every transgressor. He didn't say that. But what he loved was specifically... Uh, directed at that world or the cosmos. I told you what that Greek word was in this universe, and it's an ordered system of things. So God so loved this ordered system of things. He liked the world the way he created it before the fall. That's what God loved. Well, well why do I say that? Well, I, I share with you what the word says. Uh, Psalm 5.5 5 says, The fruit is stand, uh, shall not stand by life, and you hate all workers of iniquity. So does God love workers of iniquity? Now, what's a worker of iniquity? Somebody who does not the truth. It's a lawless person. Somebody does not follow. So does God love everybody? I ask you this. Well, we, 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 here's what our head does. You know why? Because we've been programmed. Well, God loves everybody. Well, he hates all workers of iniquity. So if he loved everybody, that would mean that God was two-faced. That God was spiritually bipolar. Right? Right, right? Why is it? Because we've started off from a false premise of this love thing that we're talking about. Beloved, let us love one another. And so the false premise is, and, it was, and folks, it, it didn't start in our generation. It's been for generations and generations, this, 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 this ecumenical thing that came in and says, we've just got to embrace everything. Folks, that gate was narrow 2,000 years ago. And folks, that gate is narrow 
today, and few there be that find it, and fewer there be that enter it after they find it. Well, Proverbs 6, 19, I gave you this a few weeks ago. There's six things that the Lord hates. Mm -hmm. uh, no seven he detests. Right. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to doing wrong, a false witness, he pours out lies, a person who sows seeds of discord among the brethren. And so, does he love those things? Now, see, those things don't happen by themselves. Right. You're not going to see some mannequin standing in the corner uh, sowing seeds of discord. Right. You're not going to see some line, uh, some dog running down the, uh, the street, you know, wagging his tongue and, and, and being a lying tongue. That's not what it is. Those things are characteristics of the heart of the wicked people. That's right. Well, consider this. For God so loved the world that he ordered his people, now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. Do not spare him. But put to death both man, woman, child, and infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. 1 Samuel 5, 2 and 3. For God so loved the, the world that he said, I want you to go and I want you to kill all these people. Does that work today in most churches? Doesn't work, does it? Well, he's the Lord God and he does not change. So what happened? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Okay. For God so loved the world that the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods, they and all that, that appertained to them, they went down into the pit alive, and the earth closed up on them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallows us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed 250 men that had falsely offered incense. Number 16, 32 and 35. For God so loved the world. So is it arbitrary? Is it just some ambiguous type of love? Well, for God so loved the world, it came to pass at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat upon the throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, the firstborn of the cattle, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and his servants and all the Egyptians. There was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house that there was not someone that died. Exodus 12, 29 and, 20, 29 and 30. For God so loved the world. Well, what happened? Well, for God so loved the world that he smote the man of Bethshemah because they had looked into the ark of the covenant of the Lord. He even smote the people, 50,000 and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten, smitten many people with a great slaughter, 1 Samuel 6, 19. Now, is that a different God? Absolutely not. That's the exact same God. And what does all those things tell us? That tells us the seriousness of sin. That tells us the seriousness of violating God's truth. That tells us the seriousness of transgressing the righteousness of God. But you know what it also tells us? It tells us that how fortunate that we are. How, how fortunate that we are that God says, listen, I'm going to stop the, the stopwatch on my judgment. I'm going to withhold judgment. just for. I'm going to withhold what you deserve. I'm going to withhold what all of these 50,000, 100,000, 3,000 people, 250 getting swallowed up. I'm going to withhold all of these things that every single one of us deserve. Why? Because just like David said, in my mother's womb, I was shaped I was born. I was conceived in iniquity. All those things that in sin, that that's where I came from. That I came out repulsive. I came out needing a savior. Why? Because when man fell, everything fell with him. But I'm going to stop that just for a minute, and I'm going to allow a covenant to be extended unto you, and it's going to be the age of grace, the age of my divine influence. And I'm going to give you the ability, when I begin to speak to your heart and life, to get that off flash. I'm going to let you do something that you couldn't do before the Spirit came, and that's choose to do righteousness. Folks, I've shared this with you before, but before, before Jesus came, before the cross, before the Holy Spirit came to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, we couldn't do right. Even under the best of circumstances, even though they had all these laws of Moses, why? They tried and tried and tried. Uh, Abraham, he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, but the guy just couldn't tell the truth about Sarah. <laughs> Simple, just tell him it's your wife. You don't think he could deliver you? Dude, you're, you're, you're fathering children at a, nearly 100 years old. <laughs> Well, David, a man after God's own heart. Oh, tried and tried and tried after his own efforts and all of these things happened. But the guy is playing Peep and Tom upon the top of the palace when kings go out to war. Come on, dude. Put 
putting uh, 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 her husband on the front lines to be killed. Moses, man, you were so meek. You came up on the mountaintop. You saw the deliverance of God's people. But why did you smoke the rock the second time? Mm -hmm. Brother, don't you have sense enough to know that you just don't do stuff like that? So with all of our efforts, with all of those things to get back to him, but that man kept goofing up. And so what had to happen? Well, because of one man's sin, the first Adam, right. sin entered in. That's right. And everyone was made unrighteous. Right. Come on. But because of one man's righteousness, one sacrifice of Jesus, mm -hmm. many, many could be made righteous. Come on. So it's not a different God. What it is, is he's brought in. He's brought in the payment, the ability for that propitiation to see something change. And he's withheld it. So the word says that God judges no man. But he's committed all judgment under the hand of his son, Jesus. And Jesus said, listen, I didn't come into the world this time to condemn or to judge the world, but the world through me might be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the judgment that is going to befall anyone that does not have a relationship with him. Folks, judgment delayed does not mean judgment denied. Do you hear me? Just because we don't get swallowed up in our rebellion like Korah, just because we don't get smoked down like, like the men that offered a strange fire of incense, just because that doesn't happen, does not mean that we're not building for ourselves up that punishment that's going to await us on that day. It doesn't mean that. It means that God has given us an opportunity. He has withheld those judgments. He's withheld those things. Why? Because he wants to restore Order. He wants to bring those things back. So we teach that we have this un immutable and this unchanging God, uh, and but we say he, you know, he looks on us a little bit different than he does those all the other unrighteous people. You know, those people are a lot more wicked with us, folks. Listen, if we would have been born two, four thousand years ago, that was us. We weren't no, we weren't a covenant people. We were the wicked, wretched, pagan people. That was us. We would have been the ones rebelling. We would have been the ones standing there on the streets of Jerusalem saying, crucify him, crucify him. That was us. But we get so arrogant. We get so prideful. We get so full of ourselves and full of religion that we think, well, God, listen, you're going to like it. Like I said this morning, we think that God is pleased with just the scraps off of our table. Absolutely not. If you're going to be his disciple, you deny every bit of self, take up your cross and follow after him. So that they just were forced to abandon the truth. They just want us to embrace this theology that does not see any connection between love and truth. Folks, there's got to always be a connection between love and truth. Any gospel, any theology, any teaching does not say that love and truth have to go together is a damnable doctrine. It is something contrary to the word of God. Romans, uh, the, the, here's what the word says. Um, or how, here's what people say. They say, uh, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. Ever heard that? Yeah. Ever said that? Tell the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's not supported by the Word of God. That's right. Okay. Uh, for one reason, uh, because without a sinner, there wouldn't be any sin. That's right. right. Sin is not like a, a, a like a low hung door that you bump your head on accidentally. That's not what sin is. Sin is God saying, "Don't do it." You do it. That's right. So sin is sin is 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 something that you produce. It's not something that's floating around out there that you're going to bump into. That's right. And so this whole loves the sinner and hates the sin is saying, well, you know, I, I, I love my car, but I don't love my automobile. What do you mean by that? I don't mean anything by that because they're both one and the same. You can't have one without the other. Sin is simply that term we use to describe the actions that people do when they transgress the righteousness of God. Romans 3.23, all have what? Sin. Sin that comes short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin, the consequence, the judgment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That same eternal life that we get in John 3, 16. God loved the world so much, he loved order so much that he gave his only son, that whoever believes upon him would have the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the justifiable consequence of being an unredeemed sinner is what? Death, Right? So what about innocent people that never knew? Folks, there are no innocent people. I don't care if you're chopping coconuts on some island off the coast of Indonesia. There are no innocent people. I don't care who you are. I don't care how you were brought up. There is nobody innocent. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no loopholes that says that there's no other name under heaven where a man can be saved. But the name of Jesus, every knee has got to bow and every tongue confess unless 
See, once you start putting these loopholes in, you open up a can of worms and you depart from the faith and you give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil and you no longer endure sound doctrine, but after your own lust, your own desires, you'll heap to yourself teachers because you had itching ears. Somebody tell me there's a loophole. Somebody tell me my repulsive alcoholic grandfather that was so wicked and so perverse that because somebody got baptized for him after he did or we paid some penitence to some, some perverted priest that he's going to be okay. Folks, that does not exist here. It's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. The question is, is how are you going to meet judgment? Are you going to meet him on this side of grace, which is mercy? Or are you going to meet him on that side of grace, which is judgment? That's the question. And that's what we have the opportunity now to, to combat and to bring together truth and love together. So Revelation 20 and 13 to 15 says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in them, and death and hell gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of those men, according to their deeds. You know why they were judged according to their deeds? Because that's all they had. That's it. That's the very best that they had. And folks, the very best that we have is still just filthy rags. Right. Now, folks, you, you may get this weird visual that says we're going to stand before God and there's going to be these big gigantic jumbotrons like in Texas Stadium and all this stuff that you've ever done is going to be paraded. Like, oh. Folks, that's not going to happen. I belong to Jesus. And if I'm faithful and just to confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Not he's not going to hold those things in check and show them on a jumbotron in, in, in heaven one day and say, okay, you're saved, but man, I ain't going to believe what this cat used to be. Right. No, he puts my sin as far as the east is from the west. And he casts those things in the sea right. of forgetfulness when I do what? When I repent and I believe the truth and I allow the blood of Jesus to come and cleanse me from all of those things, and I walk in holiness and righteousness. They gave up the dead, and every one of those were judged according to their deeds because that's all they had. But it's never enough. Then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The wages of sin is death. The lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he too was thrown into the lake of fire. Folks, you're not going to stumble into heaven. You're not going to accidentally get there. You're not going to stump your two with your toe and say three Hail Marys and end up on, in the Lamb's book of life. We're saved by grace. We're saved by God's divine influence through faith. The moral compunction to think differently. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift of God. Amen. But we are created now <clears throat> under good works. Like the Word says, you know what? Show me your, your faith without works. I'm going to show you my faith by my works. I'm going to show you I can walk in righteousness. Why? Because I have faith in Jesus that I can. I'm going to show you that I can be holy. Why? Because it's my deeds? Uh-uh. Not at all. I couldn't do it apart from Jesus. I'm going to show you that I can be holy because I trust in him. That I, I, I crucify myself daily. I cast off vain imaginations. Anything that exalts exalt itself against him. And I punish my old disobedience with obedience now. And so now I can have victory. This is the victory that overcomes even our faith. I have victory. Why? Because I have faith. I have faith. Why? Because my faith comes by hearing. And my hearing came from the word of God. For God so loved the world. Folks, there's a reason I stress all this stuff. It's so we can get a, an accurate understanding of these verses. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Folks, listen. The apostle, he, he was really dealt with this issue. We just talked about this last week. Think about where we came from on this. What was it? Don't beloved every, believe every spirit. Now, now think about how interesting it is that this, this discourse got injected into this, this subject matter right here. Don't believe every spirit, Brother Ron Boovin. Try the spirits whether they're God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And all of a sudden he's saying, Beloved, let us love one another. Well, what's, what's the reason for that? Well, there's a perfectly good reason for that, because it goes into this discord, because it's that he was establishing that the, the God kind of love looks like verses Looks like the, the a seeking after truth. That's what you love one another is when you're 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 absolutely founded upon truth. And so here, here's the thing. How many of you guys have been married 20 years or more? Okay, a few of us, 20 years or more. Now, I, I, I told Melly and I have told people all the time. Listen, in 20, we'll be married 27 years. The seventh, uh, the, the the 15th of this month. That's uh, 17th. Another important date for us. But the 15th of this month, we'll be married 27 years. Okay, now when we got married, we were saved. We got married, we were going to serve Jesus. We got married, that was the foundation of our relationship. 
And we knew from day one that unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that built it. Okay? So for 27 years, I guarantee not every day of those 27 years did we like each other. Come on. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> But not every day did I get up and I'm thinking, oh, man, I shall like her. <laughs> not every day did she get up with little starry eyes and say, oh, he is so sweet. She never happened. Right. But I'll tell you what, every day we got up in love with Jesus. Come on. Yeah. So we did. We had the truth of who he was. And so what it did allow us to do, oh, man, I can't have that attitude towards my wife. Amen. If I love her, right. because the word says, husbands, love your wives as Christ right. loved the church, right. but gave himself yeah. for it. Yeah. Oh, no man ever hated his own flesh. But what did he do? He nurtured it. He kept those things. And he said, I give you a great mystery. He said, I speak concerning Christ in the church. So, man, I can't begrudge my wife. Why? Because if I hate her, it means I hate me. I can't do that. I've got to love her as Christ and love the church. How do you do that? Well, man, he laid his life down, his, his desire, his will, his whims, his plans, everything else. So, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold her in that type of regard. Well, then I can go up a few verses that we like to quote first as dudes. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Sarah did call Abraham Lord, but I'm not asking my wife to do that. But folks, you know, see, that's the foundation of that relationship is truth. Why? Because when the emotions are gone, when the hair has gone, when the, the muscles are gone, never had any of them anyway, when all that stuff's gone, what do we still have to have? We've got to have the foundation of truth. And some of you know it firsthand. Some of you have gone through broken relationships and broken marriages and divorce. What's the problem? No truth. There was no truth in it. There was, no found, there was nothing to fall back on and say, listen, I know how I feel. I know the struggles in my, my flesh. I know all of those things. But when there's no truth to fall out, it's like the guy that's walking the tightrope without a safety net. <laughs> Splat. And there's no recovering from it. So that's why the foundation of love, whether it's in a marriage or whether it's in our relationship with God, has always got to be based upon truth. Why? Because when I read the Word and I read all that, that terrible stuff that, that happened to people, and man, I'm, I'm kind of feeling for them. But you know what? What I love? I love the truth. And I love God more than I love the circumstance. And I say, bless the Lord. Some of you have heard me tell the testimony about when my son Jared was 18 years old. He'd taken off, was in rebellion for two years, into drugs and all kinds of stuff in Texas. And I was talking to my mother one day on the telephone from when I was living in Florida. And she told me, she said, I just want to tell you about Jared. I know you're worried about him. I said, Mom, I'm not. I said, you know, worry would put me in his place. I said, the Bible tells me that can I add one inch to my height by worrying? I said, I'm five foot, ten and a quarter, flat footed, just like I've been since I was 15 years old. I'm not getting any taller by worrying. And I said, he's the one that needs to be worried because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I pray for him. I believe in God for his soul. But I told her, I said, but mom, if we stand before God on the day of judgment and he looks into Jared's life and he says, your name's not found written in the Lamb's book of life that he's cast in the lake of fire. I said, you know what I'm going to say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I love that boy. I laid my life down for him. But I tell you what, at the end of the day, there ain't nobody, nothing that I love any more than Jesus. Amen. I love the truth that came and dwelt among us. Folks, that's got to be the foundation of every relationship every marriage, everything that we do in the gospel, even with one another. I love the truth. So we get that idea that God kind of loved, that perspective that we have. One is built upon eternal truth. When we see those things that was offered right here in First John, it was built upon these temporal feelings, all these emotions, all these other things. But now I want you to look at some. Look how the word joins truth and love in, in a few other passages of Scripture. Look what it says in Proverbs 27 and 5. Proverbs 27 is, and 5. A few of you, I think, this is like your Facebook status. Open rebuke is better than secret love. <laughs> Some people are laughing because it probably is their Facebook status. Now, open rebuke is better than secret love. Folks, you know what? It's easy to say that you love someone. But if you don't ever do anything to, to alter the path of destruction in their life, we talk about it with our, with, like with our kids. You know, when my, when my son was in rebellion, he's going to hear about it. He's going to hear about it from me. He wasn't going to feel comfortable. I, I wasn't going to sit around and play parcheesi with him and tell him everything was okay. He was going to hear it. And so as a result, what happened? He didn't want to talk to Dad when he was in that condition. Why? Because, man, Dad is a broken record. Yes, I am. I, I don't want to talk about what happened on uh, the football game. I want to talk to you about Jesus. 
That's what I want to I went mention to you. That's going to be the focus of our conversation until you repent. You know, you repent, start serving Jesus, and then you can tell me about that big old fish you caught. Up to that point, really, I could care less. You'll drag all that stuff, and you'll think it's okay, that you're real cool, and you're real neat. But open rebuke is better than secret love. We've got to be willing. Now, do you like rebuking? Uh, i, I got to stop it. I don't. I, I don't take any pleasure in that whatsoever. I, I'd rather not. I'm really, by nature, I'm pretty laid back type of guy. But the same thing is, if somebody's going to catch on fire, then you got to warn them. Right. You know, you really do. I mean, uh, myself, you know, I'm just not by nature that person that just wants to, you say, well, really? No, I, I, I do the things that I do because I have to do this. You see what I'm saying? Well, man, that's true. I mean, I saw you out on, on Bourbon Street doing that. I do those because that's what the Bible tells me I have to do. Not because I'm sitting around thinking, all right, man, I get to go blow somebody up. And I'd rather not. I'd rather give them a cookie and say, hey, have a great day. And here's your bottle of water with the church name on it. That's just not gospel. That's not going to set anybody free. I, I, I can't uh, do the hooker by crook presentation when I know that if they know the truth, the truth makes them free. Okay? But if I'm going to rebuke, I better rebuke in love. I better not just be trying to blow somebody up for the sake of blowing somebody up. Why? Because then that all that means is I'm the one that's really blown up, right. full of pride and arrogance, and I'm really trying to uh, deflect something that's going on in my life. So uh, Proverbs 27, 5. How about Ephesians 4, 11, and 16? I love this. He says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. We've got some that fit that category now, and we've got some of you that are going to fit that category. You know what I'm saying? I, I believe that in a place like this, there, there's some of you that have stepped into that role, stepped into that office, and I believe in a place like this, and even somebody that may be watching this, I mean, God has called that. He's preparing you for that. And he's giving you the ammunition. He's giving you the criteria of your life to get that. But look what he gave that for, to equip or to prepare or to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature, the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, False truth, but by the trickery of man and the cunning crafts and deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth, how? In love. In love. You're still connected. I've got to speak the truth, and I've got to speak it in love, because I love the truth. That we may grow up together in him, who is Christ the head, from whom the body joined and fit and together, that each one supplies the need of the other, every effective part, which where every part does its share, causes growth by the body of the edifying itself in love. How about 1 Corinthians 13? Don't you love the love chapter? Until somebody points it at you, right? Well, I love what it says in verse 6 of that love chapter. It says, love, so we say love. I don't, I don't do that because it means anything. It's keeping you awake. Love does not delight in evil, sin, but rejoices where? In truth. Love always rejoices in truth, they're the bedfellows. They're the common companions with one another. Second Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. said, even him, this is talking about the, uh, the, the manifestation of the Antichrist. Look what he does. Even him who, who coming in is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. We, we're already seeing those things happen. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. Folks, the people that are easily deceived is the people that are looking outside of this for truth. That's it. If they're looking for something extra biblical, they're looking for something here, and they try to call it, they use the buzzwords like revelation, knowledge, and all these things. Folks, if it's contrary to this, it's contrary to Jesus. Come on. The Spirit of God is never going to speak anything contrary to the Word of God. It's going to be consistent with this. He said the reason they're perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth. Let me ask you a question tonight. What do you love more? Your traditions, your wishes, your desire, your plans, or the truth? So we like to say that, but we don't like to always live that. Come on, that's right. I just don't like that. But what does the Bible say? Blah, 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 blah. I don't care what the Bible says. That's the way we get an attitude sometimes. We want to reject the truth. Why? Because it doesn't fit into what we've done. It doesn't fit into to, to, to our, our neatly little package of things. And so we come down to the Word of God and say, I don't want to care. I, 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 I meet these people all the time. They claim to be born again. They claim to be saved. I say, well, well wait just a second. All I'm telling you is what the Scripture says. Well, I, I, do I close that Bible. Well, folks, I'm not going to close that Word. That's my source. That's my roadmap to, to righteousness. He said, but they were deceived because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved 
And for this cause, God will give to them strong delusion that they'll believe a lie. Folks, you stay out of that word long enough. God will say, go ahead and believe your lie. I'll let you be delusional. I'll let you get so caught up in that stuff. And you'll get so caught up in it, you'll think you're doing right. You'll think you're so righteous. You'll think you're so spiritual. You'll think you're so pleasing to God. But he said, because you believe the lie, you did not love the truth, and you sought after the signs, the lying wonders, all these things. He said, I'll let you believe that stuff. And he said that they might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, that sounds a little bit more like that God in 1 Samuel yep. and back in Exodus, right? Well, you know why? Because it is that same God. Is, Everyone that loves truth is born of God, born again, and knows God. That's what the Word says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loves God, loves truth, is born again, and knows God, is intimate with Him. But he does not love God, does not know God, because God is love. Now, look at verse 9. We've got about a minute. And this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Folks, that word us, he said this was manifested towards us. That word us is the word ego. Don't let go of my ego. It's a different word, but that's what it sounds like. And it's a first-person possessive pronoun. And it really means a group or type. And so he uses that. He says, well, listen, the love of God was manifested towards the whole group, towards the whole opportunity, that he's not willing that any of us might perish, but that all could come to eternal life. Well, how do we do that? Well, John tipped the scale, and he, he tipped the hand and when he came in, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He brought a concept that was not alive in the Old Covenant. Why? Because people didn't have the ability to think differently then. They just had the ability to do differently. He said, repent. Think differently. In those days came John preaching, heralding out of the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. For, for, for God's reign, God's place of influence, God's place of control is within reach of you. Think different. Get on the right track. Think about the truth. Why was that important then? Why? Because he was preaching to a bunch of guys he grew up with. Don't forget that he was the son of a priest. So he knew all those guys who were about that age and were now serving. He says, listen, guys, I know what you do. I know what you think. I was the one hiding behind that, the, the temple with you doing that stuff. So he shows up on the scene and said, you got to think different. you got to have a different type of motivation. you got to have something more. You've got to have the mind of Christ. Don't be conformed to the what? Image of this world, but be transformed. Romans 12 and 2, by the renewing of your mind, to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Amen. <laughs> Father, that's what we want to be. We want to be lovers of the truth. Help us, Lord God. Help us to be lovers of the truth, Lord God. Help us to seek your face, to know you, to desire after you, Lord God. Father, we don't want to be found stumbling around in darkness, but we want the illumination of your word and your spirit, Lord God, to be active in our life. We thank you for it, Lord God. Give us a hunger. Give us just that insatiable desire, Lord God, to just dig in deeper, Lord God, to the things of the Spirit, Lord God, to dig in deeper to your word and to really let it be alive in our heart, to commit ourselves to it, Lord God, to be uh, ones that, that, that study, Lord God, to show ourselves approved, Lord God, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, Lord God, like, like workmen who have no need to be ashamed. We thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we pray over our offering tonight to dismiss. Uh, we thank you for what you're doing in, in, this, in this church, Lord God, what you're going to be doing in the greater New Orleans area. We thank you, Lord God, for, for those that are just investing in this whole process. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah,